Anyway, we're going to get right into the teaching today. I hope you're, um, I've already been blessed. Pastor Lisa, that was a great word for the offering. The, wow. And Mackenzie did so amazing on the keyboard today. And our worship team. Naoshi, you brought it. Denise, of course, all the team. Thank you guys so much. So last week, just give me a reminder. You, last week we were talking about Abraham's altars. And we talked about how four times he went to these altars. And we talked about what, what you do at the altar. You worship at the altar. You consecrate yourself at the altar. You pray at the altar. But we also added something that most people don't understand about an altar. Is that an altar will help build your spiritual arsenal. So let me say it again. So you worship at the altar. You pray at the altar. You consecrate yourself at the altar. But an altar is also a place to build up your spiritual arsenal for spiritual warfare. I believe the reason Abraham could have rescued Lot, defeating basically nine kings, the reason he could do that is because he built up his spiritual arsenal at the place of prayer. Prayer is a very powerful weapon. The prayers of righteous people, according to the book of James, what? Avail much, okay? So, the prayer doesn't stop in our Torah portion. The prayer actually continues because Abraham begins to intercede um, in this Torah portion that there would be righteous people saved who would be living in the cities um, that God had said were unredeemable. These cities are going to be destroyed, Abraham. I got to tell you about it because you're going to become a mighty nation. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. And it's that promise still stands in and through Abraham. All the families of the earth have a blessing. Um, and, and so... So God says, all right, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy these five cities. It's believed there were five cities in the plain. We know mostly, we hear about two of them. But there's not two, there's, there's five. And so um, Abraham starts bargaining with God, if you remember. So Abraham, he starts with 50. And he says, well, if there's 50 righteous people, and what he was, the, the Hebrew understanding is, he was saying in the five cities, if there's 50, if there's 10, in each, uh, an average of 10 righteous people in, in one of those cities, then, you know, don't, don't overthrow those cities. Don't destroy those cities. We know, then he works down, 45, because obviously there's not 50. He goes 45, and then he goes, uh, well, what if there's 40? What if there's 30? What if there's 20? What if there's 10? And I don't know if anyone understands what intercession is. Intercession is to entreat God on behalf of somebody else. There's many types of prayer in the Bible. There's, there's supplication prayer. There's prayers, you know, there's prayers for different things. But intercession is primarily praying for somebody. So in other words, you're, they might not pray for themselves. You're stepping in and saying, I'm going to pray for you. And we need that. How many times do you know sometimes you can't even pray for yourself? You need someone to step in and pray for you. Pray for you. And so Abraham, he, he, when he's praying, he says, to, he's, he calls God the judge of all the earth. And he says, will not the judge of all the earth execute righteous judgment? Will, you're the judge. It's actually the first time in the Bible that God is called judge. And we know Jesus talked about God as judge. I think it's in Matthew. And he says um, that God is a righteous judge. He's a, he's a, so he's not an unrighteous. He's a righteous judge. In the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, chap, uh, I think it's in chapter 9, verse 10, it says that we all, after we die, we're going to stand before God as what? Judge. He's the judge, right? So um, then... In Romans, it gets even more specific. It says that not only will we stand before God as judge, but it's actually our Lord and Savior that we're going to stand before. So look in Romans 14.10, because I think it's important that we see this. It says, why do you judge your brother? Why do you set at naught your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. Christ, it's the, the word Messiah or anointed one. We're, we're all going to stand before that judgment seat. Look in 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all be appear before Messiah's court of judgment 
where everyone will receive the good or bad consequences of what he did while he was in the body. Now, I don't know about you. I don't want to talk about judgment. I don't like to talk about judgment. I don't even want to think about judgment. In fact, I'm thankful for the day of atonement that we had a few, uh, about a month ago where we went to God and we confessed our sins and we, you know, we acknowledged Yeshua as our atonement. I'm thankful for that. So I really don't want to go to there, there but I want you to see some things today about judgment because I believe in the power of intercession, it is possible to overturn a judgment. Just throwing it out there. Now, okay, so here's Abraham again. Look at, let's look in Genesis 18. Let's just look at Abraham. Verse 24 and 25 says, Maybe there are 50 righteous people in the city. Will you actually sweep, a, sweep the place away and not forgive it for the sake of 50 righteous? Far be it. For you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous along with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Abraham's making this case. You can't treat righteous and wicked people the same, God. You're a righteous judge. Far be it from you. I mean, this is serious. I mean, Abraham, he's going to bat for these people. Shouldn't the judge of all the earth do what is just? I mean, in the Hebrew, it's, it's should the, the mishpat uh, uh, of the, uh, the, the word for judgment, the shapat, the judge of the earth, do mishpat, do judgment. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same word used twice. You can't just call yourself a judge and not do the righteous judgment. So Abraham had an argument, and his argument was that God should not destroy the entire cities. All the cities, if enough righteous people were present in those cities to make a difference. I think this is his argument. Is there enough people in those cities to make a difference? Can their righteousness somehow expand, enlarge? Can they be an influence like we saw today? Can they witness? Can they, can they tell others? Can, they, can their, their deeds, their good deeds... Be seen by the people. Can their menorah light, if you will, shine to those wicked people? I think it's a good argument. I don't know. I think it's a good argument. He's saying, hey, you don't have to destroy everybody. Just if there's enough righteous. And really the number 10 in the Bible is such a significant number, right? The 10 is a legal congregation. So remember the spies that were wicked that, that, that gave an evil report? There was 10 of them. They were called an evil congregation, but they're also going to be a good congregation if there's 10 righteous people to say, we're going to live right in Babylon. Like remember remember, remember Dan, uh, Daniel? He's living in Babylon, but he's not living like a Babylonian. He's living like a Hebrew. So, is there enough people who will follow God and make a difference in wicked cities like Sodom? Is it possible that there is enough people that God will save these cities? That's his argument. So let me just show you a little bit. What do we know about Sodom? What do we know about Sodom? I'm going to give you only today the biblical text. We can go outside the biblical text. We can, we can, there's much understanding about what Sodom was, um, their laws there, how they treated people. But just at the scripture, just in the scripture, I want you to see how bad Sodom is. Genesis 13, 12. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan. This is the first mention of Sodom. Um, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the valley. He moved his tent from place to place near Sodom. This is so interesting. But the people of Sodom, here's what the Bible says of them, were raw. They were evil. They were very great sinners against God. This is what the Bible says. The people are raw. They're evil. They're violent. They do bad things. They're not just evil. They're exceedingly great in the sin category. They excel in the sin category. If you want to give them a star, five stars, a, 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 a medal, a, a, a trophy, they get the trophy. You are the greatest sinners this world has ever seen. That's what God says. I want you to also notice that, that Lot did not go directly to Sodom, but he went from place to place in that valley 
in probably there's five cities in that plain. And he went from place to place. And eventually he said, no, I like Sodom the best. Okay. So look in Genesis 18.20. It says this. Amplified classic version says, and the Lord says, I think this is a good version. Because the shriek of the sins, it's a, the Hebrew word for cry. Um, because the shriek of the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is exceedingly grievous. Now, you put up the Hebrew there just for a moment. Just put that. Did I get the Hebrew there? The, the next slide. You got the Hebrew of the next slide? Okay. I thought I should, maybe you didn't put Okay. See what it says. Ki rabah vechata tam ki kavoda moed. So, ki rabah. There, the rabah is, is a word for numerous, for great, for, it's just, it's just like an enlarged number. And fahata is their sin. And it says, it's kavada, kavada. It's heavy. It's very heavy. It's very heavy. So now go, go to the next um, the slide. So the great and numerous is the sin and it's exceedingly heavy. The sin level, if you will. The sin level, it had rose to a state of multiplication. It was an exponential expansion of sin. And the Bible describes it as very heavy. Now, you know this word, and you're probably not going to believe what this word is for heavy. It's the word kavod, which is also the same word for glory. Glory. It's the opposite of God's glory. It's the opposite of good glory. So look at it. it says, kavod means to be heavy, to be weighty, to be burdensome, to be grievous, to be hard, to be rich, to be honorable, to be glorious, to be burdensome. It's the second mention of the word. Meet me in the foyer. I'll tell you about the first mention of the word if you want to have the expanded version of this sermon. But I want you to see God says the, the sin is heavy like the glory. The glory of God is heavy. But here it's not the glory of God. It's the sin level is heavy. The sin is weighted. The sin, it's, it's, it's very thick, if you will. And the word moed, it's, it's moed, kavod, it's muchness, it's in force, it's a force, it's an abundance, it's exceedingly. So you can't make this up. Rav, it's abundant in quality. You can't even, for me to try to say how much is the sin, how great is the sin, how heavy is the sin in the sight of God. It's not even just person to person. It is person to person. But it is getting God's attention. It's that bad. So much that God says, I have to go see if what I'm hearing, the cries of this, uh, of the great cries, is it great cries of the people? Is it great cries of the very sin itself? Yes, that's what I want to say. So now look in Genesis um, 19. So Abraham prays. He stops at how many? Ten, right? He stops at ten, and it looks like the story's over. It looks like, hey, there's not going to be ten people. I'm going to destroy all those cities. It looks like, and then these two angels keep going on. Abraham's talking to three. Then he's talking to God, and then two leave, and they go to, to, to the gate of Sodom. And there are lots there. And he encourages them to come into his house. But look in Genesis 19.4. But before they could go to bed, the men, were, the men of the city surrounded the house, young and old, everyone from every neighborhood of Sodom. So can you kind of think for just a moment that the sin level got so thick, heavy, abundant, that not one person in the city was not affected by the sin. It says every person from the city came to Lot's house to do what? To do something bad to the strangers that he entertained in his house, which were actually angels who came under his house for protection, right? So, but 
every, every, it wasn't just the old, it wasn't just the young, it was it, the sin level affected everyone. And I'm saying this because you can kind of see today where things are going. I was born in 62. I remember graduating from Nova High School. And I can't imagine what our kids today have to even deal with compared to what I dealt with when I graduated in 80. It's a joke. Our school was an angel <laughs> compared to this. The, the worst person in my school is probably likened to the best today. Anyway, okay. So sin had reached all the people, right? The young, the old, they all surrounded Lot's house. And they went, they went around Lot's house because Lot broke the laws of their city. And the laws of the city of Sodom were laws of anti-kindness. Don't help anyone. Don't take care of anybody. In fact, if somebody comes in, you treat them badly. Many stories about this in extra biblical sources. So, in a sense, Sodom did not have any true justice because you couldn't get justice in Sodom. If you sought justice, you're going to get thrown out or you're going to get... In fact, they had... Okay, I, I put up there, no kindness allowed here. That would probably be the sign on the outside. No kindness here. They actually had a closed-door policy for visitors. And to discourage vi visitors, the city would be involved in all this sexual perverseness, promiscuity. They would violate any kind of common decency and order. Um, they were not allowed to even help people who were poor. They weren't allowed to feed people who were hungry. If you were, didn't have a house, too bad. If you remember, it was these same people who literally tried to break down the door to Lot's house. Pastor Lisa mentioned the door. A door is an entrance. A door is an opening. It's a place you can, it's an egress. You can go in, you can go out. But they did not want, Lot, you're not allowed to have a door on your house because you're not allowed to take in visitors. You're not allowed to take care of the widow, the stranger, the poor. The, or you're not allowed to entertain them. But Lot does the opposite. And that's why they said, you're judging us. Lot made his house a refuge. He has a banquet for these guys. In the Hebrew, he literally throws them a banquet. He gets matzah, unleavened bread. And Hebrews 13 tells us something. Look what it says. It says, stay on good terms with each other, held together by love. Be ready with a meal or a bed when it's needed. Why some have extended hospitality to angels without ever knowing it. This could be Lot. It's also Abraham. Abraham had his tent door open, right? But it could be Lot. He entertained angels and might not even, when he, it says there are three men, excuse me, two men came. And he opens his house. He gives them a meal. Why? Because the, the Hebrew way, the way that Abraham taught Lot was the way of kindness, we are called to be like Father Abraham. We are to do the deeds of Father Abraham. And Abraham was kind and Lot or Lot got that. He was kind. Even though he probably knew it's going to cost him. Keep reading. Regarding, regard prisoners. We got hostages going on right now. We got hostages, right? They're prisoners. Regard prisoners of you as you were in prison with them. Because that's what God says. God said, when you were in Egypt, I was there with you. Look on victims of abuse as if, it, if what happened to them happened to you. Wow. So last week, Abraham and his disciples rescued Lot from being taken as a prisoner because he was living in Sodom. This is where Lot was living. He was living in Sodom. And Sodom was one of the kingdoms that rebelled against Shedeleomer. And, and after Lot is rescued, it's interesting He's rescued from 
You know, he, he had been taken captivity. He came from Sodom. Where does he go afterwards? I guess he doesn't have the Manasseh anointing to forget. He goes right back to Sodom. And this Torah portion, we find him sitting at the gate of Sodom. But before we dog him today, because you and I probably would have done the same thing because he had a home there. He didn't want to start over. I've heard how many people tell me, Pastor, I love what you teach. I don't want to start over. It's too hard to start over. Well, you're going to either start over now or later, but eventually you're going to start over. Let's look at Lot. He had to start over. <laughs> okay, look at Genesis 19. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening while Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he got up to meet them. He bowed down his face to the ground. This is, a, this is a, a custom. It's not worship. And he said, here, please, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house. Spend the night. Wash your feet. You can get up early. You can go on your way. But they said, no, 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 no. We will spend the night in the open plaza, in an open place. But he urged them strongly, so they, they turned aside to him, and they came into his house. He prepared a feast for them. He baked matzah, and they ate. So he's at the gate. Look at the Hebrew word for gate. It's the word sahar. It's an opening. It's a door, a gate. It's the city gate, the door, the, a port. A, a port. So keep in mind, we are in the year, the Hebrew year that we just started at Rosh Hashanah, 5784. The number four is Dalit. It stands for a door. It could be a gate. It's an opening. 5784 is the year of a door or an altar. A door can be open. A door can be shut. A door, an open door can be something good. An open door can be something not so good. A shut door can be something good. A shut door can be something not so good. You can't look at the door and think just because it's a door, it's a good thing. No, or whether it's open or shut, it depends on the context. If you have an open door to sin, it's not a good thing. If you have an open door to preach the gospel, it is a good thing. If you have a shut door to evil, it's a good thing. God's doing it. But you have to be careful. If, God, if there's a shut door and there's, it's a shut door means there's no blessings, everything's shut up for you, it's not necessarily good. So it's got to be in context. So Lot is where? He's at a door. He's at a gate. Why is he there? Why would, why would he go to the place of the elders of the city. Why would he go and sit at the gate there? He must have wanted to make a difference. He must have believed, I'm not like you, and I need, there needs to be somebody that's not like you at the gate. See, there has to be some people in public service that aren't like everybody else. I don't know who they are, but there needs to be somebody here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, do you remember Mordecai? Mordecai, the, the uncle, if you will, of Esther? Where do we find him in Persia, Shushem? He's sitting at the gate. God wants to have his people at the gate. Why? Because it's possible you can make a difference. It doesn't mean you will, but it's possible. You might turn, turn one person. We've got to have more righteous people at the gate. So look in 2 Peter 2, verse 7. This is, what God, this is what the Bible says about Lot. I know people dog him. I've read Jewish people, Christian people, every kind of person. Everyone has their opinion on Lot. But I think we can't give our opinion. We need to see what does the scripture actually say about Lot. Because obviously God knows Lot better than, you know, we can say, well, I think Lot was this. And, you know, look what, but what does the scripture say? Look at 2 Peter 2, 7. Now, argue with the scripture. When you get to glory, if you get there, when you see Peter, you talk to him. Don't send me an email. I'm not going to fight with you after service. 2 Peter 2, look what it says. He rescued Lot. Now look what he says. 
a righteous man deeply troubled by the shameless immorality of the wicked. So what do we learn about Lot? God rescues him. He says he's righteous and he's bothered by the immorality. He doesn't like the wickedness. For that righteous man, how many times is he called the righteous man? Does that mean anything to you? It should. While living among them, um, and while living among them, he's tormented in his righteous soul day after day by lawless deeds he saw and heard. Now, I can't explain why did he want to be there. But let me ask you something. Why do you want to live in Florida? <laughs> we can tell it to any person anywhere in the country. Why do you want to live there? It's so wicked there. It's so bad there. What if God called you there? To be a light. What if he led you there? What if God is leading you out there? To be a light and be a witness. A testimony against them. I don't know. I'm not, I don't have the answer. I'm just letting you know. I don't have the answer. So the angels, they pull Lot into the house. Remember, Lot goes outside. He's trying to reason with the crowd. You can't reason with these heavy, grievous Sit, you can't reason. Have you ever tried to, re uh, to reason with people that are sunk in their sin? You're going to make sense to them? I, I don't think so. So the angels say, enough. Pull. They try to break down the door. Lot pull, uh, the angels pull Lot into the house. They blind those outside so they could not find a pata. They could not find an entrance. There's no way in the house. It's not they couldn't find a door. There was no opening. This is a good shut door, if you will. The enemy could not get into that house. When we're in Jesus, when we're in Yeshua, I believe the Lord himself shuts the door to the evil on the outside and says, no, you can't touch them. They're my anointed. Do them no harm. I've got them. He blinds them. He blinds them. They could not find the entrance. It's a supernatural blindness. It has to be supernatural. You can't have a whole city trying to find a door, an entrance, and, can't, and they can't find it. It's something supernatural. God can sometimes supernaturally blind people. They can't even see you. It did it not happen when Jesus walked through the crowd? They wanted to kill him. He, they couldn't see him. Now look in Genesis 19, 15. When the morning came, the angel told Lot to hurry. Get up. I don't know how they slept that night. Just truthfully. Can you imagine? You got the whole, the whole city outside your house. That had to be supernatural sleep as well. I don't know. He, he, they, they went into some kind of slumber. I don't know. Get up, they said. Take your wife, your two daughters who are here. Otherwise, you'll be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he dallied. And the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and his hand of his two daughters, Adonai being merciful to him, and led them, leaving them outside the city. When they brought them out, he said, flee for your life. Don't look behind you. Don't look back. Does anybody remember that scripture in the New Testament? It says, this is like one of the shortest scriptures, remember Lot's wife. <laughs> Don't look behind you. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere in the plain. Escape to the hills. Otherwise, you will be swept away. So he gets up in the morning. They say, all right, it's time to go because it's judgment time. And Lot's lingering. He's hesitating. He's Dallying. If you look at the Hebrew word and then the root of that word, you're going to find something really interesting. It's the word maha, maha, and it means it's apparently a denominative from 4100. Properly, this is this is the word. He, what what it means to linger or hesitate, to question. Hmm. I'm going to just stay there all day. Or hesitate. By implication, to be reluctant. To delay, linger, stay.
stay, say yourselves, or tarry. Now, keep that definition up there. Just keep it up there. Let me remind you. When Abraham was entertaining the angels, everything he did was hurrying. He did it quickly. He moved quickly. He made haste. He was, go get the calf quickly. All this stuff. It's a lot of references to quick. But here, Lot, when the angels say it's time to move, he's hesitant. He's Now, I want to tie that in with something. Could that be the reason why in the book of Revelation, there has to be a command by God saying, come out of Babylon, my people, come out. Could it be we like Lot, we don't want to move so quick out of America or the nation we live or the systems. We kind of like it. We're lingering in it. We're enjoy- now, we're hesitating. We're just, do we have to go right now? Can I have another night here? You know, I really enjoyed. Sodom is so beautiful. Okay, have you seen the gardens? Have you seen the, the beautiful waterways? Have you gone to that restaurant down on 5th? I mean, it is amazing. <laughs> they had this special. God has compassion And I believe God has compassion on us even when we too are in a state of lingering, hesitating. But remember, why are we hesitating is because we're questioning. Is God really going to destroy it? Is it really that bad? Um, Can I, you know, does God really want me to leave here? I mean, look what I've got invested. I got this home. And and God, you gave me a place at the gate. Come on, who gets a place? I got influence. And um, so look at the root word. The root word, so, so there, there's the Hebrew maha or mahat uh, means to deny or refuse. So I, I thought that was funny based on, so you got the Hebrew up there? Yeah. Ma, go back, go back, go back. Go, go to the graphic, put the graphic. So I thought it was interesting to deny or to refuse. Just think about that. In light of Pastor Lisa said about my doctor's report, my doctor, my, my beautiful eye doctor, who we've known since she was a little girl, she said to me, she said, Pastor Ken, you're in denial. I need to change your prescription and make it what, it, what I think it should be. Even though it came out wrong, um, the lady did it, and I had better vision than I had the year, but she couldn't. She said, I was in denial. I'm not sure if I'm the right one who is really in denial. I think she was in denial. Okay, but so the word lingering, so it could mean he's in denial. What? Who are these angels? Are these angels? What do you think? Like, come on. Are, they, are you really angels? This city's really going to be destroyed? Like, God's never done anything like this. Fire's going to rain down from heaven. The whole city's going to be overturned. Go to the next part. Go to the, now go to the root word. The root word is ma. And Strong's H4100, it translated in the following manner. This is telling you what, how, why, whereby, wherein, how long, how off, to what end. Just leave that up there. Because we ha- I have a brother in the church who's in business, and we have, we've been having this ongoing conversation. He started a business, and he said, you know, I've been tempted to quit so many times because if you have your own business, anybody have your own business? There's a reason why people work for somebody else, and there's a, people, there's a reason why people start their own business. And the ones who start their own business, they quickly find out it was a lot easier to work for somebody else. And you go, when you clock out, yeah. set it, forget it. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to think about it. You have your own business, they call you up in the, it doesn't matter. You got to take it. The buck doesn't go to anybody but you. And, and so the conversation is, he, he, he says, Pastor Ken, if you don't know the why, you walk away. And he'd send me a text and he'd send me, he'll send me a text and all the things he had to do. He says, but I know the why. Because he knows one day he's going to have a business that's going to be able to be passed down to his kids. He knows what he's building is not just for him. It's a legacy. And he's paying the price. Why? 
Because he, that's a pun. Why? Because he knows the why. But this scripture lingering is telling you something. Lot wanted to know the why. How, how long, what to what end. There are some times God is going to tell you, you got to leave and you got to cleave to me and you're not going to know the why. And how many people don't like that? <laughs> Isn't it interesting that when God tells Abraham to leave Lech Laha, to leave his father's house, his relatives, his country, he never tells him the why. Because the walk of faith, you don't, oh, and Lee, if you're back there, there, the walk of faith means you're not always going to know the why right then. You might know it later when God will reveal it to you, but you still got to be obedient. But now listen, Lot is not being obedient. Lot is asking, oh, what? What's happening? I'm not really sure right now. Um, uh, what those people, are they still out there? Um, um, <laughs> can I go back to the gate? And the mercy of God... This is people today. They don't know. What is it? Is this right? Is it wrong? What, what's going on with the world? Can somebody please explain? Go search. Search YouTube. Search uh, the, 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 all these new social media outlets. Guess what? You're going to be more confused. I challenge you. In fact, that's why I tell you. Stop looking at that stuff. You're going to find more confusion. Because they don't know either. Well, they don't want to read the Bible, right? So look in book of Jude, chapter 22. Uh, verse 22. There's no, there's no chapter. There's only one chapter in Jude. Look at And have mercy on some who are doubting. Huh? Huh? Save others, snatching them out of the fire. I mean, to me, this is Lot. This is the angels. This is the Lord taking the hold of Lot's hand, his daughter's hand. And he's wondering and he's doubting. And they're literally going to snatch him. And we're called to snatch people out of the fire the same way. They're in confusion. They're not sure. And some have mercy, but with fear, loathing even the clothing spotted and polluted by their shameless immoral freedom. So you got to be careful. We know that. The voice translation puts it like this, verse, 20, verse 22. Keep being kind to those who waver in this faith. Wow. Pursue those who are singed by the flames of God's wrath. <laughs> remember, this is New Testament. <laughs> Just remember this. And bring them safely to him. Show mercy to others with fear, despising every garment soiled by the weakness of human flesh. This is God's mercy. His mercies are new every day. Great. Because of his mercies, the Bible says what? We are not consume even while we're lingering even when we're hesitant do i go forward do i go pastor ken there's a door do i go through it do i stay uh, i don't know what does the lord tell you and even when you're not sure god's mercy is there mercy keeps you from what you deserve you deserve justice or judgment, but mercy triumphs over judgment. With every act of judgment God has, it's always been tempered by his mercies. Now look in Isaiah 63. Are you getting anything out of this? Isaiah 63. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. I believe God is... Speaking the best of God's, I believe he's, he's prophesying they're going to tr be true in what they say. And so he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. This is powerful. 
He's talking about Israel. When Israel was afflicted, God was afflicted. When, pe- when There's hostages right now in the, in the tunnels of Gaza. Gaza means the strong. It's a spiritual stronghold. It's a physical stronghold. That's why there's these tunnels everywhere. It's, it's, str- it's a stronghold. The word means strong. The strong. And God says, I'm with the hostages. I'm with them in their affliction. And the, look what it says. So remember, Israel's in, in basically all, the whole nation's a hostage in Egypt. And so the angel of, the pre, of his presence, this is an interesting phrase. The angel of his presence, God's personal angel, saved them. In his love, look at this, in his love and his mercy, he, how does God redeem? How does God save? He saves out of love. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a, right? It's a gift. It's love. He redeemed them. He lifted them and carried them all the days of old. It looks to me that Lot is getting the benefit of what God will later do with Israel. Israel will have an angel and the angel will get them out of Egypt. It will take care of them in the wilderness. And it's going to all be delivered by by God's love for them. Because at that point, Israel definitely did not deserve to be saved. Now, look at how this scripture about the angel of the presence saving, redeeming, and lifting Israel. Think about maybe the story of Lot is prophetic. It's the prophetic of Israel who will be saved out of Egypt. Lot will be saved out of Sodom the same way Israel will be saved out of Egypt. You'll see a lot of angelic activity in the story of Israel being saved in the time of Egypt, in the time of the Passover. There's a lot of angelic activity. Here in our story, there's a lot of angelic activity. Hebrews talks about angels. They're sent to what? Minister. There are stories of people being rescued that you can only attribute to these stories to angels because the people were not found. It's just, how did they get saved? Well, there was this white truck, and they put all these people in, and, and then all of a sudden, we couldn't find the truck, and nobody knows who it was, and saved 70 people. But also maybe, so remember, the way prophecy works, it goes backwards, and then it goes forwards. So sometimes you read a scripture and it has something to do with the past, then it will have something to do with the present, but then it goes fast forward all the way into the future and maybe the story of Lot is even the last days of God rescuing his people out of Babylon. All right, let me just go over some things with you and I'm not going to be too long today, but I just want you to think about some things because I saw something I never saw and, it, and I thought I saw it only because I read it in the Hebrew. But when I read it in the English, it said the exact same thing. And I said, Lord, how did I miss this for all my life? So remember, Abraham, he intercedes for righteous people to be saved. Remember his argument if there's, you know, if there's 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, right? He's actually not praying for righteous people to be saved only. He's also asking God, God, will you save the cities for the sake of righteous people? So, okay. Also, remember last week we said Abraham is a picture of Messiah. He's a type of Messiah. Abraham's a man of intercession. What is Yeshua doing right now? Hebrews 7. He ever lives to what? Make... Intercession is what? To pray on behalf of another. Abraham's praying on behalf of these cities uh, of righteous people. He might know them. He might not know them. He's praying for them. Does that kind of go along with Timothy who says, first of all, pray. Let prayers and intercessions, right? And giving the thanks be made for what? All. Kind of tells us we need to be like, like Abraham, right? So how is Lot ultimately rescued or saved? Is it by his own righteousness or is it something else? Is he saved because he's righteous? Remember, Abraham asked God to save 
Ten people. But how many people were saved in the story of Lot? Well, you know it. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. Does that ten? But Abraham stopped at ten. He said, God, I'm just going to speak one more time if there's ten. So how many people are there? There's four people. Oh, wow, we're in the number. And not, but wait a minute. It gets worse. Because one of the four, as soon as they get saved, turn into a pillar of salt, right? Look at Genesis 19, 27. Lot's wife looked back. What was the instruction of the angel? Don't look back. She becomes a pillar of salt. That morning, Abraham. Now, look at this. You, this is amazing. That morning, Abraham woke, woke up early. He was up early. He hurried. He hurried. He got that hurried again. He hurried out to the place where he had stood. He's not lingering before the Lord. He looked out across the plain to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he saw columns of smoke and fumes as a furnace rising from the cities there. So God, look at this, verse 29. God heeded Abraham's plea and kept Lot. Wait, wait, why is Lot saved? Because Abraham interceded. Do you see it? He didn't get saved because he's righteous. Thank God he was righteous, but that's not why he got saved. He got saved because Abraham interceded. Abraham's plea and kept Lot safe. You never know who you're praying for that God's going to bring them out safely. He's going to bring them to himself. They don't deserve it. They don't earn it. It's not their righteousness. Removing him from the maelstrom of death that engulfed the cities. In, in the Hebrew, it actually tells you that the cities were overturned, overturned. It's a double in the Hebrew. It's, um, it's, it's anytime you see a double word like uh, the word for, for overturned twice, it's telling you it's something legal. It's telling you something that is exponential, but it's also telling you possibly that there's going to be another overthrow of some cities. So it's the intercession of Abraham that kept Lot safe. God remembered Abraham's prayers for the judge to do rightly. So do you think the judge did rightly? Apparently he does because he saved Lot because Abraham prayed for him. When God judges, his justice is tempered with his compassion and mercies and love for all the people of the world. I don't want you to be a hater, especially in this season. I want you to understand what you're called to do, to be salt. Christian said it, we're to be salt, we're to be light, we're to love people. Hate sin, but love people. Last time I checked, you are not the one to say somebody is not redeemable. That's not your call. Only God can say they're not redeemable. So look in John 3.16. You know it, but I just want to remind the crowd today, the Torah people, not to forget this. Look in the Amplified Classic Version. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son, so that whoever believes in, trusts in, cleaves, clings to, and relies on him shall not perish. So who does God love? He loves the world. He calls the world a prize. He gives up his best for the world. Just like Abraham, when he went to the land of Moriah, he prophetically offered up his son Isaac as an offering on the same place, if you will, that Yeshua, Jesus, gave his life. So if, look, let's read the last part again. It says, if you trust and cling to, rely on him, you shall not perish. You will not come to destruction and be, or be lost, but have eternal or everlasting life. For God did not send the Son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn, to pass sentence on the world. But that the world might find salvation and be safe and sound through him. Does God love the people? Are you called to love people? You don't have to judge people. All you have to do is live God's ways. And listen, living God's ways will be a judgment to people. Because they're going to say, hey, why are you living like that? It's like, well, this is what God said. Are you judging me? No, I'm just living God's ways. But when you don't do God's ways, it's already a judgment against you. 
And that's why you need to put your trust in God and follow him. Now, I want to show you something that I never saw before. And it's in the English as well as the Hebrew. It's Genesis 19, 18. So, remember, the cities were overturned of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were, um, and Lot was rescued because of Abraham's prayers. So, intercession has the potential to overturn things, to overturn a judgment, an impending judgment. I'm going to show you something that I, I can't even believe is in the scripture. I never saw it. It's in plain sight. And Angie, you'll love this kind of stuff because truth is always in plain sight. Genesis 19, look what it says. And Lot said to them, Remember, they, they said to leave. He's, he, they take him, he gets them outside the city. And Lot says to them, oh, not that, my lords. Behold now, uh, behold now. and what he's, saying, what he's saying is like, I don't, I don't want to just flee to a mountain. I, I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a city guy. It's like the difference. Remember, we had Sukkot, and some of you came to me and said, Pastor Ken, I'm not a camper. I like hotels. And I'm like, yes. Okay, so, all right. Oh, no, my Lord, I'm a city guy. Behold, now, look at this. No, you got to see this. Your servant, and he's talking to angels, but in the, in the Hebrew, all of a sudden, he calls them Adonai. He, he switches to, to, to Lord. Behold, now, servant, your servant has found favor in your sight. And you've magnified your kindness and mercy in saving my life. So look at the words here. Uh, favor, kindness, mercy, saving. Okay. Oh, you did all this for me. But I can't go to the mountain. I can't escape the mountains. Lest some evil overtake me and I die. Oh, let, it says, see, see now, sorry. See now yonder city. It is near enough to flee to. It's not too far. It's a little one. Oh, let me escape to it. Is it not a little one? He's like making his case. It's little. It's small. It's not a big deal. And my life will be saved. Now, it says the angel here. But if you look at it in the Hebrew, it's, Adon it's, 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 um, it's the word Adonai for Lord. So I'm not sure if it's an angel speaking because there's two angels and he's talking to one. Is it God? Is it the angel? It's a, kind of the same story with Abraham. We don't know. And the angel said to him, see, I have yielded to your request or your prayer concerning this thing also. Could an angel make this call? Just think about that. I will not destroy this city of which you have spoken. Now remember, we read from the beginning that God had said, I have to go down and see. And then when you look at the structure, it says God himself rained down. So he says, now he says, I will not destroy this city of which you spoke. Wait a minute. I never saw this before. Make haste, hurry, go there. Take refuge there. I cannot do anything till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zor or Little. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot entered Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and on Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of the heavens. And it's giving you the chronology. It's showing you that the fire that came down on Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain didn't happen until what? Until Lot reached a safe place in the city. He said, you've been graceful. You've been merciful. You've been compassionate. You saved me. Can I now go to this city? Look in Genesis 19, 21. Look, it says, he said to him, see, I have accepted. I, I favored you concerning this thing also that, that I will. This is what blows my mind. Because intercession can somehow overturn judgments. I've, he said, Lord, if you just let me go to this city, it's little, it's small, it's insignificant. But wait a minute. Let me ask something. Did anyone live in that city? Are there people in that city? 
Are those the same people that Abraham was praying for when he entreated to God? If there's 50, if there's 40, if there's 30, 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. Is this one of those cities? Absolutely it is. Because scheduled to be destroyed was five cities. But guess what? Five cities don't get destroyed. Only four cities get destroyed. Because somebody pulled on God's compassion. Somebody pulled on God's mercy. Somebody said, God, I need your grace. It blows my mind. I never saw it before. Why didn't I see it? Abraham's prayer worked, and it worked more than I could even imagine. Because probably more than 50 were saved. He went to a city, and here it says, I will not overthrow it. I will not overturn that city. The other cities were overturned. This city gets spared. Why? Because Lot's there, and Lot's only there because Abraham prayed for him. And then Lot, after he was prayed for, he prays. He says, can I just go to this little city? And it might have been selfish, but you might be in a place and God put you there to protect the people in that place. Just because you are there, that place is going to be spared. Grace, mercy, kindness, all these words are there in the story of Lot. The mercy, while he lingered, God had compassion, mercy, compassion. Then in this story, he, said, he says, I need hesed, I need grace. I need you to save. I don't know how many people were saved, but it shows me the power of intercession to overturn judgments. And just, just to, to you understand, this word overturn is hafek. It, it's positive, again, like every Hebrew word. What is it? Yes. It's positive and negative. It can be the overturning to destruction, but it can be the overturning of a judgment of a verdict. It could be overturning or cha a change, if you will. Look what it says. Hafek, to a root word, to turn about or to turn over by implication to what? To change. Intercession. Hallelujah. Why is this? Why are we in 5784? God has called us to be intercessors this year. To pray like you've never prayed before. Don't you dare give up on your kids. Don't you dare give up on your family members. You set a place for them on Shabbat. You pray for them. You call their name, up, uh, out, name out before the Lord. You pray for those you're in business with. You pray for those who you work with. You pray. Prayer is your, your primary calling. 5784. To the altar. Abraham was a man of intercession. And though it looks like, when he stopped at 10, it looks like, well, there's only going to be four saved because there's not 10. We find here that Lot picks up on intercession of Abraham and he says, can I go there? I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need your compassion. And God spares an entire city for the sake of Lot. You tell me if he's a, lot, a righteous man or not. I don't know. But that's sure telling me something. A whole city is spared because Lot says, I want to go there. It's the exact same word in the story of Purim when the, when, the, when the verdict is overturned of Haman and then the Jews get the power. Wait, this is amazing. We're living this right now. An overturning, a changing. God is a big God. Okay. Look at Esther 9. Now in the 12th month, that is the month of Adar, on the 13th day of the same, when the king's word and his decree drew near to be in execution, and that day the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them. Look what it says. Though it was turned to the con. Wait a minute. Did this happen because somebody prayed? Who prayed? Esther, Mordecai, and the whole nation. God turned it around. He overturned an impending judgment. 
the power of intercession can overturn an impending judgment of what was previously unredeemable. Zor apparently was unredeemable. It was slated to be des destroyed, but when Lot prayed, when Abraham prayed, God turned it around. Hallelujah. Let's look in Acts 4.32. Now the company of believers, look at this, was of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to them, to him, was exclusively his own. His own. But, what, but everything was common property and for the use of all. Now look at this. And with great ability and power. The apostles were continuously testifying to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace, God's remarkable loving kindness, favor, and goodwill rested richly on them all. As we pray, as we intercede, and you can't get bogged down with the news. So remember the first mention of gate in the Bible is Lot sat in the gate. Apparently he did make a difference. He was a light. But the second mention of the gate in the Bible. So what's a gate? A gate, a door, an entrance. The gate of the city is a place where decisions is made. Abraham was given a promise by God after he went to offer his son on Mount Moriah in obedience to God, which is a picture of for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Abraham was willing, got to get this, he was willing to put his promise on the altar, the promise of the future, the promise of his legacy. He loved God more than he loved the promise. He was willing to give his very best as a, because that's what God did for us. He gave his very best. But here's what you got to see. Because Abraham did this, God promised him. He says, now I know because you withheld not your only son from me. Because now I know. He said, your descendants will be like the stars of the sky, the sand of the sea. And then he makes this, this statement that has to do with the gate. And he says, and your seed shall possess the gate. Lots at the gate prophetically because God wants his people at the gate because your seed shall possess the gate of your enemies. And I submit to you, the way you're going to do it, you, you can run for politics. That's between you and God. But the best way to make a, dis, make a difference at the gate is build an altar. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. He said, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. When we turn our face to the wall, when we turn our face to Jerusalem, that's what Solomon said. He said, people all over the world, even those that aren't Jews, even those that don't believe in you, if they will turn and they will face this place and they will ask from the God of Israel, the God of Israel will grant their request to show them that he is the true and he is the living God. The power that we have now, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strong and bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We have to put our armor on. We have to understand that we are not warring against flesh and blood. I know you watch that stuff and I know you look at stuff. I'm not, I can't make you stop looking at it. I'm not saying not to look at it, but I'm saying first build an altar. God told him, God told Abraham, this is what, what's going to happen. What's the first thing God, Abraham said? Hey God, yeah, those cities are unredeemable, but can you save it? Now, what if, wait a minute, what if Gaza could be saved? Whoo, how do, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Why not? 
What if there's a, what if there, what if we pray for Gaza? What if we pray for those people there? I don't believe all the people are wicked there, do you? Because what, what I found out most times, there's a small group of people that are controlling the masses. The ones that have the, and Lord, let their monies be cut off. Because you cut the money off, you're cutting the head off the snake. And the Lord, the lion roared. I, I don't know, I heard the lion roar. Pastor Lisa, come up here. Let's take hands with somebody. Take hands with somebody. Let's, let's agree. Let's agree that God's got, let's, let's invoke prayer. Let's use our power of intercession to make a difference. Father, we just come into agreement right now, Lord. We build an altar. We build an altar right now to you. Father, if there's anyone here who's never asked Yeshua, Jesus, to come and live in their heart, today, Lord, I ask that you would touch them right now. If that's you, you've never asked Jesus to come in your heart, before we can go any further and pray for others, you need to make it right with the Lord. You need to make sure that today, if he was coming today, if this city was going to be destroyed, would you be saved? The only way we can know that is when we accept Yeshua as Lord and Savior of our life. So if you've never asked him in your heart, raise your hand so we can pray with you. We, want, we don't want to go any further until we give everyone the opportunity. If you're not right with God and you know you're not right with God, today's the day. Make it, get right with him. Father, I thank you for Yeshua. I thank you that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead. You are our Lord. You are our King. Today, I ask you, Lord, to search our hearts. If there's areas where we've been lingering, if there's areas where we've been questioning, forgive us. Forgive us. Give us great grace. Give us your kindness. Give us your mercy. Give us your favor, we cry out, Lord, right now. Father, we lift up Gaza to you right now. We come into agreement right now that your arm is not too short. Lord, just like you saved the city of Zor, you can save Gaza. You can save the people that are living there that are redeemable. Lord, we cry out for their salvation right now. Lord, just like Abraham, Lord, is there 10? Is there one? Lord, is there one? We cry out for their salvation, Lord, that you will reveal yourself to them. Yeshua, that you will walk up and down the streets, that you will release angelic hosts to walk up and down the streets, Lord of Gaza. Even in those tunnels, Yeshua, reveal yourself. Show them that you are the way, the truth, and the light. And they could come to you. They could come back to the Father Abraham through you, Yeshua. Reveal this to them right now, we pray. We cry out, God, for a great awakening to come over the Palestinian people, Lord. That there will be a shift. There will be a change, God, over their hearts, Lord. That they will be like the Babylonians. That they will not be afraid to side with Israel. Oh, God, that they will recognize that you are real, that you are true. Oh, Lord, we cry out for even those here in the United States, those Palestinians, Lord. We cry out for them, God, that are living here in our country. We cry out for their souls, that you will reveal yourself to them, that they would realize that Allah is not the true God, that he is dead. He is nothing. You defeated him. Oh, Yeshua, reveal yourself. Reveal yourself to them. Awaken them. Awaken them to the truth. We cry out. We cry out. We cry out for the Jewish people, Lord. Oh, Father, that their eyes will be opened and they will look on their Messiah. And they will see you, Lord. They will see you. That you died and you rose from the, on the third day. 
Oh, we thank you for a mighty revival over our nation with the Jewish people, with the Palestinian people, with the Arab people, Lord, with every, those in, Lord, those, God, who are wavering, we cry out for a mighty revival in our nation right now. There will be a shift. There will be a change, God. We cry out for boldness, Lord, that we will have boldness as your people, God, that we will love not our lives unto death. We will preach the gospel. We will live the gospel. We will live the truth, God. I thank you for this great grace that's coming on this congregation right now, that we will not be ashamed of the gospel for the, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. That's what you said, Lord. So when you put us in the path of Jewish people, anoint us, God, to speak your word with boldness, with signs and wonders following. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you're overturning. You're overturning, God. You're overturning the judgment over Gaza. You're overturning it, God, right now with a mighty revival, with a great awakening. Oh, that people will be amazed. People will be stunned. The world will stand in awe about what you're going to do, God. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. We humble ourselves and we pray right now. We ask you, Lord, to forgive, forgive, forgive. You said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and repent, we repent, God. We stand in the gap. We repent for unrighteousness right now. We repent. You said, then I'll heal the land. You said it, God. So we make the intercession right now. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you're about to do. Hallelujah. And over our families, we stand in the gap right now for our children, for our grandchildren, for our aunts, our uncles, our mothers, our fathers, our cousins, our brothers, our sisters. Oh, we stand in the gap right now, God, that, Lord, they will turn from their wicked ways. Lord, that you will snatch them out of the hell. You will snatch them, Lord, out of darkness, and you will bring them into light. Lord, we stand in the gap that you will have mercy. You said, if I believe in the Lord, me and my household shall be saved. Our household shall be saved. They shall be saved. Everyone, everyone, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We stand today on that promise that our households, they shall bow their knee. They shall receive you, Lord. They shall. They'll stop wondering. They'll stop questioning. They'll stop wallowing in the world. And they'll turn their face towards you, God. We thank you for convicting power, your convicting power that comes, Lord, on our families right now, on this nation. Convict, convict. Con oh, God, no more compromise. No more compromise. No more compromise. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you. Oh, God, we're going to stand still and we're going to see the salvation of the Lord. Me and my household, you need to say it. Me and my household shall be saved. Oh, me and my household shall be saved. We thank you, Father. We thank you for it right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We're going to receive the, the elements of the bread and the, and the wine, the cup.